Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to uh, session number nine. Oh, I got that right on the first try of the mechanics of poetry. Yeah, getting into the nuts and bolts of this making poetry stuff. It's been a delight to uh, even try to do this every Thursday at noon. And I'm not sure that's the best time for the world to record, but it can be watched anytime on YouTube in about two or three hours, it'll be up on YouTube and people can watch it at their leisure at 1 a.m. in their pajamas or whatever. Uh, as far as the recording time, I was alluding to uh, this time is the best time for me because this is a time that I have available. Uh, the evening, not so much. So that's why I'm doing it at this time. But if it ever becomes a problem, I'll be asking people for another time. This is not that time. Instead, I'll talk about today's topic. Today's topic is uh, how do you make metaphors? So I'm presuming there is more than one way to make a metaphor. And that's why I'm gonna ask everybody here one by one to say what they wanna say about metaphor. And I'm gonna go first to first on board, you never know which way to point, Linda V.E. Crawford. You get the first word today on metaphor. Ooh, well, yeah. thank you. Um, so in terms of um, kind of your key question about how I go about making metaphor, before we started recording, I was uh, saying that, well, I was saying a couple of things, but, but one of them was that sometimes as a thought comes to me to, you know, to write a poem, whatever time of the day or night, thought pops in and just as, just as the thought of what I want to write about comes into me, it's like simultaneously something comparative, a word, a memory that I associate with the topic all comes together and merges at the same time. It's not that I'm sitting thinking about, here's a topic I want to write about, and here's perhaps maybe the metaphor I want to use to take me through the poem. It just all sort of comes together, mushed together simultaneously. And from there, then, then I'm, I'm flying. Um, and what I like about metaphor in poetry, and you know, some folks are really great at it. Myself, I'm, I'm working on becoming better at it, but I like metaphors that are you know, like unexpected, uh, shocking, um, just, uh, just original in thought. And, and it's the kind, of, the kind of metaphor that would make me say, ah, that is exactly what I'm feeling or thinking, but I didn't know it until you or great poet wrote it. Mm -hmm. So, and the one, one example that comes to mind for me is a couple of years ago, I became aware of the poem, and this is the last thing I'm going to mention, I became aware of the poem, I believe it's called Tradition by Jericho Brown. And I have to confess, I didn't know who he was. I was at a university workshop setting and learned about the poem and his name simultaneously. And in effect, he's referring to flowers and plants and, and then from there, rolls into um, referring to specific African-American men who had been um, killed by, by police, et cetera. And, and it was such a, a shocking comparison, but yet immediately it was like, ah, that makes perfect sense. It, it's, the, it's something natural to think of, but you would not have done so until Jericho Brown, put it on the page. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, I was just trying to find that poem, but you have to pay $17. <laughs> I have the book. Uh, yeah, well, if you have it, you can put it up. Then I don't have to put it up. I was going to put it up right now. Well, well I have the book. So if you want to hear it read. Oh, OK. Oh. Well, I'll say one thing, Linda. I remember. Go. You said something that was really fascinating. Uh, we were talking about ephrastic poetry, and you remember you said when you saw the moon, it made you think of another image. 
like an eye. So that's your mind making metaphor, right? Right away, it's like it's in your wiring, right? You see one thing and it makes you think of another. So that's definitely a very organic way to make metaphor, right? You, you see a certain something and it makes you think of something else. That's yeah, yeah, exactly. And I kept on mute for a while because there were some fire engines going by blurry very loudly, so. Yeah, but it's good to have that antenna up. It's like you have that antenna up in your head that you're ready to receive something and convert it, right? What, what does it make you think of? That's really a good thing to do. And here, here we go. Thank you, James. So uh, did you want to hear the poem? Do you want to read it, James? So we can hear some of those words. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully I can do it justice. <laughs> I don't even know that second word. <laughs> uh, the tradition, Aster Nostrustium Delphinium. We thought fingers in dirt meant it was our dirt, learning names in heat and elements classical. Philosophers say could change us. Stargazer, foxglove. Summer seemed to bloom against the will of the sun, which news report claimed flames hotter than the planet, hotter on this planet than when our dead fathers wiped sweat from their necks. Cosmos, baby's breath, men like me and my brothers filmed what we planted for proof we existed before, too late sped the video to see blossoms brought in seconds, colors you expect in poems, where the world ends, everything cut down. John Crawford, Eric Garner, Mike Brown. Did you want to say something, Linda? It looked like you wanted to say something. No, just, just nodding because I am remembering when I first heard that poem and several of us in the room, you know, we're, we're kind of going, ah, where, where is this going? And then suddenly, I think maybe by a couple of lines in, it started to hit. So then you could enjoy, well, enjoy is like the wrong word, but you could emotionally then go through because it was leading you through to that, um, that final um, line. Um, so I've just never, I've never forgotten that. Uh, and I don't know that I've, I'm sure there are other poems that do something similar, but I'm just not aware of them. And I've always remembered that one. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I heard it for the first time. Thank you, James. And uh, I was listening and right away, there was that uh, it's like a gardening metaphor. It goes from dirt to blooms, cut down. So that was a very consistent metaphor, an extended metaphor this poem that it was carried through from beginning to end. In fact, if I may, uh, because I have a kind of a question, uh, because that you're right, that was consistently throughout the poem. And on joining this session today, one of my first questions I had was I was thinking about, well, does the metaphor have to fully carry all the way through? Can it open with it, end with it? and throw in a few of the metaphors along the way. Is that mm -hmm. frowned on, not frowned on? So when you begin to kind of discuss that, perhaps you could answer that question for me. Yeah, that's the question of the day. That really is the question of the day. There's more than one way to make a metaphor and almost as many ways as there are poets, uh, but labeling it, looking it over, uh, it seems that when you're composing, it's just like when you were looking at the moon, right? That uh, an organic correlation is the first thing that hits you. And then maybe another artistic impulse you'll have is that you want to continue this metaphor because it, there's a story behind it, right? That's what seems to be going on in, tradi in the tradition, right? So it's carried on because it, it helps illustrate the journey. Uh, that's a conscious decision that the writer makes to do that or not do that. Um, 
as they're jumping from one thing to another, maybe the metaphors do the same thing. But I'm just one opinion, and I want to give uh, everybody a chance to make an opinion on that. So I'm going to turn to Kat, Katrina, if you wanted to say anything about metaphor. Well, when I think about metaphor and creation of metaphor and right versus wrong metaphor, I don't know if I'd say right versus wrong metaphor as opposed to appropriate or inappropriate for the circumstances metaphor. Um, but when I think about conceiving metaphors, um, um, as an example today, um, I um, was thinking about this um, instance in my teenage years of these of this one hen that we used to have. Um, we had several red hens and we had one silver hen. And the the roost the two red roosters we had would constantly go after this hen and mount this hen. And then once they were done taking their advantage, the other hens would peck at her. So this hen was constantly pecked at. And I often wanted to put this in words, but I didn't um, know how to, to think about it or um, what the concept would be. So um, today uh, I was just in the shower and I was thinking, huh, that could be a metaphor for black women in slavery, where you have these, this, different person who gets picked at by society and treated as this sexual object. And then you have um, white women punishing them for <clears throat> the whims of their masters. So um, that is starting to develop. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> that poem is starting to develop today, right now in my mind. But also, you know, that's how I think of metaphors. Like right now, I have some tulips that I planted and they were looking really nice. And for some reason, the rabbits are going coming along and just snipping off the tulips, but not eating them. They're just biting them off and leaving them there. Okay. So I feel like that's a metaphor for something, but I don't know what yet. And that's... And that's how I go at looking at metaphors is that I'll see something and I feel like it's telling me something. It's giving me a lesson, but I, I haven't encountered the lesson yet. So it just kind of sits on me and then something will happen and I'll say, oh, it's like those tulips. And that's how I end up writing my poems and metaphor. Yeah, that's a fascinating difference already, right, from our first two speakers. Linda sees the moon and uh, looking at it sees something else, and I. And Katrina, she sees uh, the behavior of the chickens, and that behavior makes her think of uh, a larger illustration of that behavior that's in, the, in human life. All right, so those are two different metaphorical approaches already. Everyone's got different approaches. So did you want to say more about that, Katrina? Or? No, not really. Um, sometimes uh, when I'm teaching and I talk about metaphor, I will tell people to come up with their emotion that they're trying to um, um, illustrate and I'll say okay and right now I'm thinking a lot about anger because you know of the workshop I have coming up in a month and I I'll say what is the picture of anger what is the color of anger or what flashes to your mind when you think of anger like that first image that comes to mind when you think of anger that's your metaphor yeah your emotion is a metaphor what is the metaphor of that emotion and your workshop is, you're talking about the Warrior Poets Workshop you're going to have in mid-May, right? Um, June 11th. Oh, it's June 11th. Okay. Yeah. I got the date wrong. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, uh, 
it's looming, but not large enough just yet. But uh, the concept is great. And, and uh, I was showing Linda earlier, the infamous metaphor dice, Taylor Molly's metaphor dice. And he seems to be a conceptual metaphor. You got, you got, I'm trying to open the box. He's got uh, emotions like apathy, guilt, and uh, then he's got, I guess that would be uh, what, what these metaphors are. He's got sucker punch, disguise. So you just have to combine them. I don't know why the red, white, and blue like that. I'm not sure. Nobody knows. I don't know why. America. Is that why he's got them that way? All American metaphors? Anyway. I thought you're supposed to take one of each color. So I'd take one white, one red, one blue. And maybe... Yeah, they each, um, and I don't have notes in front of me, but I, he said in effect, you know, each color does something. So you'll find that yeah. whatever is on red, it's either, yeah, uh, you know, so, so, the, so red always represents either, I don't know, and I don't yeah. want to say because I'm gonna miss it. I'm gonna illustrate you. it right now. I wanna answer your okay. question. Very We're good. on the same wavelength today, Linda, thank you. <laughs> No, and it's only because, as I mentioned earlier, I sat in on a workshop that he was right. at recently, but I, my notes aren't in front of me. Oh, with uh, what Katrina was saying, right? If this is American, people say red, white, and blue. So if that's the order, then it reads, getting fired is a petulant popularity contest. Okay, so that is a... I guess a classic uh, Taylor Molly metaphor coming from an emotion and then finding the metaphor for that emotion. So that's a third way of making metaphor we've already discussed here in just over 10 minutes. So that's great. Thank you, Katrina. We're going to keep the ball rolling. Oh, oh I'm not metaphoring. No, ah. <laughs> By going to Chris. Chris, I know you've got some things to say about metaphor, sir. I'm listening to the metaphors that have been given so far in the session. And uh, to make a general statement about a metaphor is it sets one thing equal to another, typically not related to each other. Um, or, and it occurred to me earlier that one of the strengths that we have to use, or one of the tools that we have to use, is um, association. Now, they have to use in poetry in general is association or uh, denotation versus connotation that, that words mean to people a lot more than just the meaning that is the obvious one in your poem. Um, so essentially using a metaphor gives us double association. We have the associations with uh, the defined word that we're using with the annotation or the uh, denotation. And we have the associations with the um, other word or phrase that we're using uh, to compare the first one with. So we get double associations, which adds a lot of depth to our poetry. Um, and I think that's one way that, or one of the reasons that we use metaphor. Um, but we've also, in the course of the discussion, given examples of different kinds of metaphor, um, of putting associations or groups of social organizations next to each other. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of those is the simile, which you just gave an example of. Um, there's a metonymy, there's a synecdoche, there is metalepsis. Um, if a metaphor is, my love is like a red, red rose, or my love is a red, red rose, that's a, typically a metaphor. Um, what Shakespeare used is my love is like a red red rose, which is a simile. Um, a metonymy would be my rose is sweet, where 
um, we're absolutely we're actually substituting um, one word or concept for another. Um, uh, less often recognized, but still one is I seek my love's hand and Mary. That's a synecdoche um, where we are substituting a part for the whole. We're substituting a hand for the whole person that I just called my rose. And there is uh, an even more obscure one called the metalepsis where we're substituting a, a phrase or concept with which we have association um, for the thing that we're talking about, my girlfriend in this case. And this would be something like my rose turns into a pumpkin at midnight. Um, we have associations with the concept of turning into a pumpkin that we get from Cinderella where a coach turns into a puppet. So we're saying my Love is a coach that turns into a pumpkin at midnight. <laughs> uh, another one is uh, I've got an eight o'clock meeting, so I really have to catch the worm tomorrow. Um, that's a metalepsis as well. Uh, it's possible to write poems, even of some length, with no metaphors at all. Um, uh, Make, I made several poems like that. Or, oh my God, uh, metaphorless poems? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Metaphorless poems, poems without metaphor? Is it exactly. possible? Um, or a poem where there's no metaphor until the end, oh. uh, to the last line. And that metaphor provides a serious impact. Or gives more impact to the last line than um, it might otherwise have had. Wow. Uh, I find using metaphors or much or creating metaphors are much like Katarina was saying that um, they you start with the. Uh, uh, associations. You read something, you hear something, you, and then you uh, associate other things with it. Um, and then those get made into metaphors in your poem. And you finally think of the poem to go with those metaphors. Uh, and a lot of what I write happens that way. A lot of what other people write that way. Um, and it's also to have a poem that itself is a metaphor. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Robert Frost um, stopping by the woods uh, on a snowy evening. Um, um, the uh, poem I read, um, which I call uh, Avocados, or or could call um, is itself a metaphor for a kind of um, a kind of relationship, the flow of a relationship, or another poem uh, called Roller Coaster. The whole thing is um, describing life as a roller coaster. Um, it uses other metaphors within it, but mostly the whole thing is a metaphor. It's, um, life is not actually a roller coaster, unless you're really obsessed with motor roller coasters. But I beg to differ. <laughs> oh, my life has been nothing but a roller coaster, man. I don't know. Is it? Am I the only one? <laughs> oh God. Mm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but. Life without this, that's the life like this. Oh, uh, I'm that's, never... that's still, this life is not actually a roller coaster. Um, you're describing life as this. Yeah. Or you're associating life or the motions of life with what a roller coaster looks and feels like. Yes, so having ridden both, I say they're quite related. 
Yep. And it does things to your stomach. Yeah. Well, I was hoping you would, you, you usually have a poem to illustrate your point. Do you have one today? Um, let me read the avocados poem, which I like particularly because it doesn't use any metaphors until the end. And one, the poem itself, although it looks like it's describing something actual or a series of events, um, is actually talking about the flow of a relationship, kind of like a roller coaster. Um, but then it ends with a metaphor, which sort of makes sense to the rest of the poem. So let me read it. Never mind that we cross paths among the avocado trees. Forget the bright wind tossing auburn strands across your sagebrush eyes. Forget your sun-worn hands that held my arm as if I were a prize to cherish. Not a passing rambler tumbling down the desert breeze. Never mind we sat your arm in mine beneath the orange blossom skies. Forget we lingered as the sunset lined your upturned face with gold. Forget how lilac shadows swept the hills to bathe us in their sweetness as our small talk settled into sighs. Never mind that we lay side by side as seaside night turned bright and cold. Forget we fell into the well of stars and on a still warm sand soared through uncharted nebulae in silence till you found my hand that pressed it to your heart and pledged together we'd grow old. Never mind our past, our precious moments shape us as we stand, but know however long the journey, you remain my promised land. So there are a whole lot of pictures in there, but they're all adjectives, they're not metaphors. Um, until we get to the end, um, where there are actually two metaphors, however long the journey, um, it isn't really a journey. We don't necessarily go anywhere or any go in any directed, any specific direction. You remain my promised land, um, which is a classic metaphor. It's um, equating to different things. Uh, is that heaven? Kind of, or all I really need to achieve. Hmm. Okay, I knew you'd have something to say about it. Thank you so much. And so that's still another way of making metaphor, saving it for the end <laughs> and have it reverberate through the whole, back through the whole poem. So you have to read it again. That's a great technique. All right. I've still got a couple more people that need to have their say. And next in line, we've got James Coates. Say what you will about metaphor, sir. Uh, so yeah, metaphor and simile are probably one of my favorite poetic devices to use. Um, I feel like I use them a lot. Um, but it's easy to, to be cliche when you're using a metaphor. So if you're just starting, you know, my love is like a rose. My, you know, love is like a flame. There's, it's easy to fall into that, that kind of overuse. Um, so I try to, I try to do comparisons. Um, to me, that's like what makes a metaphor good is the comparison um, of emotion, a feeling, an experience with um, something else. And uh, kind of juxtaposing the two concepts together and they, they merge into each other, um, which can be hard because if you're too, like, if, if the ideas are too foreign, then they're not gonna blend well. But if they're too like close, then it's like not really an interesting metaphor. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a difficult subject. So like, let's say for example, I'm running out of energy and I want to describe that in a poem. 
um, or a metaphor, I think like, okay, what other things run out of stuff? And so um, it, it's one of those things like first choice, worst choice um, <laughs> kind of concept. So it's, it could be easily used like, uh, like ink, right? So you're a writer, you write, that's a common, you know, idea. I ran out of ink. So, you know, I'm running out of energy like ink uh, or like my ink pen or something like that. Um, but if you take it to like, you know, more in depth, what else can run out of, of stuff? Okay, laptop, you know, the computer battery can run out or what about um, cereal milk? Like that might be interesting. Like I'm running out of energy. Like <laughs> when you run out of, you know, your favorite cereal, that's how the day's going or something like that. Um, so I like doing that a lot, comparing, comparing these two ideas. Um, in February, I was able to take a workshop with uh, a super awesome poet that I feel like has incredible metaphors all the time in their work, um, Rudy Francisco. And the, the workshop, the beginning of each workshop, we worked on um, writing metaphors and similes. So we took like five minutes and just wrote workshop uh, metaphors and similes based on stuff we had in our room. And that was like, just to get the writing going and the ideas functioning. And, and so that was kind of like, some of those were hard, like, well, okay, what's in the room? Okay, my lamp, my, my mirror, my dresser. Um, but some people got some really cool metaphors out of it. Um, and then, um, and then like one day he gave us a metaphor for, he gave us a, like, was like, okay, I want, I'm going to give you a specific item and I want you to write a metaphor on that. And so, um, he was like, uh, my phone is, and it was like, gone ahead, do write your poem. <laughs> And so um, this is the poem I wrote for that. Uh, the title is a, a Tool to Dig. My metaphor is a cemetery I visit daily. Each failed connection buried in the text. The pictures of deceased relationships become immortalized. Chances never realized headstones at the grave of their contact information. A haunting reminder of all the women who have ghosted me. When will I be able to let go of memories, delete reminders of failed attempts at finding love, each body a casualty in this war? When will I stop bringing flowers to honor the dead and move on with the living, a fresh start with my potential for joy? How can I turn this tool for digging up the past into a hammer building a future? And so, that was like, you know, extending a metaphor on the idea and the comparison of the phone to, you know, cemetery and, and you know, the death of relationships that just aren't um, kind of alive anymore in your life. Um, and then he has a really cool one out of his new book um, that I really found interesting. I'll fly away um, because it's hard to come up with the, with new ideas that people haven't he heard before. Um, and so this is a really short one. And it starts, it gives you the metaphor right at the beginning. Um, divorce is a stubborn grease fire. So boom, you're like, oh, snap, <laughs> okay. Uh, and then it goes on. A salivating mouth that holds an appetite after swallowing the kitchen. 10 years ago, I watched a greedy inferno steal the wedding ring right off my mother's finger. To this day, there is still a relentless shadow on her hand. The teeth marks of a 30 year promise left on a stove. We, we all thought he turned off. So I was like, dang, <laughs> poet, dang. Um, so just, you know, that, again, this extended metaphor on that concept of, you know, compares, comparing m marriage that didn't work out to, you know, this very visceral image of a fire in the kitchen that kind of burns down the place. 
Yeah, it's a great illustration. You you put two things together that maybe people did not previously think of putting together. So that's wonderful. So that's that's what, what I kind of like to do. I before I read Jericho Brown's tradition, um, I wrote a similar to poem, um, doing a, a comparison of um, my son to a sunflower growing in this soil and this soil being like, you know, the American society. And so, you know, it, it's, 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 for me, it's fun to figure out how to say, you know, old things we all experience in new ways that people go, huh, I didn't think about it that way, but I know exactly what you mean. Uh, your son like a sunflower. I want to read that poem. <laughs> well, Sounds it'll be it'll be up in in the new collection coming out. Uh, all right, this summer hopefully. You don't know when this summer. Uh, well, we're in we're in uh, layout. We're going in the layout next week, so um, you know I don't know exactly the day it's, date it's going to drop, but uh, yeah. it'll be it'll be it'll be done by the end of this month, and so then it's all the other technical stuff of who's going to publish it and, um, you know, when we're going to print it and, and all that good stuff. Yeah, we got an opening for an author in July. So definitely want to help you promote that book because we're, we are fans of your poetry, me, myself, and I. That's three people right there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, and there's another fan. She wants her say, Coco, yes, go ahead. I'm an absolute fan of James Coates. And when he becomes the United States Poet Laureate, I just want to say, I called it. <laughs> you are outdoors, Coco. I am outdoors. But you're, not, you're not far from where you live though, right? Am I right? No, and they're fixing my bathroom. So I'm stuck out here. <laughs> oh, beautiful day, beautiful day. Did you? Anything about metaphor? Anything you want to say about metaphor? Well, for me, what what one of my professors said, one of my English professors told me that um, the way that I use metaphor is very slap you in the face. Like I'm unapologetic about what I'm saying, and it just comes across very abrasive. Rather than giving you a metaphor, I show you a metaphor. Like in my poem. Um, a few of my more popular metaphors come from the poem, Would You Notice Me? And uh, a lot of people like the metaphor of when I slit my throat, a Merlot colored waterfall. So you can kind of see the blood coming out of my neck <laughs> in that poem. Um, it's not just blood, it's something more. Right? It's a Merlot colored waterfall. Or when I blow myself into a thousand billion pieces, um, what do you see in the Rorschach images along the wall? A work of art by Paul Jackson Pollock, perhaps? So I'm interjecting visuals as my metaphors for you seeing what actually took place. I like to do that a lot in my poetry. Is that a conscious decision or does it happen organically or both? I would have to say both. Like all my poetry that I write, I write in real time. Um, even if I'm given, even if I'm given a, a prompt, like I write it in real time and, and there's very little revision that I do. I try to do more revision lately, but all of my metaphors are kind of like, visual instances of what's going on around me. So I'm, I'm placing you in the poem. So it's a way of illustrating the emotion, right? Am I barking up the right tree there? You are totally barking up the right tree. <laughs> yeah, people seem to make metaphors naturally in conversation, don't they? Yeah. I'm talking to everybody, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to try to do something audacious. Uh, I'm going to actually share one of my own poems. Uh, what a frightening thing to do. 
right? Am I the only one that feels that way? Right? It's just so, so you take your song, go here, take a look. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna start safe by jumping off of James idea. Uh, let's see, I'll show you what I mean. James is gonna know what I'm talking about right away. Where is that poem? It's right there. Screen share. Forgive the rhyming. It's right there. Screen share. You made me think of this, James, this poem I wrote uh, back in 2007. It's called Be a Tool. So it's an extended metaphor. Start. With a bit of inspiration, take a blade to your heart. Chisel out feeling, clamp onto memories, drill if you have to, to find moments filed in the soul. Gauge how significant experience is, hammer away at what stops you from using your hardware to hook into the life you seek. Once found, sink a knife through your own emotional plane. Delicately work with the words as if they were pliers. Sand down your disbelief. Saw disappointment in half. Screw down thoughts to become lines. Sharpen lazy admissions. Shovel useful metaphors inside. The square of your efforts ultimately will reach meaning. Oh, excuse me, will wrench meaning. There we go. Yeah, so that's a bit uh, constructed, I'd say. Was that too safe? No, just throw, just throw the title construction on it. <laughs> and, and then you, you, you really cemented it. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks you got a lot of tools in there. Yep, can do well, yes, right? it. I was just you know, bringing out the tool bag, but that's all that poem is really doing. It's not really personally revealing. I mean, I had another poem lined up. That would be, I guess, level two. <laughs> I'm going to share it. Okay, uh, but this one's near and dear to my heart. Okay, where did it go? It's from, uh, whoa, whoa, not that one though. Yeah, there it is. Uh, share screen from 1997. 1997, when my daughter was four years old, she would say some incredible things. So I made this poem called Little Miss Metaphor. Studying out the window in my pickup truck, soon to be four, Kyla queries, Daddy, trees need to be cut like people's hair, right? We pass the San Gabriel mission on the way to grandma's house and Kyla proclaims, there's Notre Dame, Quasimodo's house. In my mother's living room, Kyla observes the Jesus figurine in a glass case. It's daddy. My sister's self-portrait hangs over the sofa. That's Pocahontas. Kyla looks up to the neglected ceiling and images water spots. Mira, mommy, patas de cocuy. That night on the drive home, mommy, I love you in the sun. I love you in the moon. Oh. These are things my daughter said that I wanted to record. Poetry was the way. She says some incredible things. <laughs> Little Miss Metaphor, yeah. So that's near and dear, and yet I'm not revealing myself yet. Hmm, there might, maybe there's a level three to this. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, I'm going to try it. But where is that one? <laughs> I have to reach cocoa levels of emotion here. That's what I'm gonna to try to do here. Uh, all right, so this one's from 2004. Uh, maybe it's constructed also. Let's see what it says. This one's called Metaphor Man. I lie back in bed. I'm a newborn infant. I float in a pool, I return to embryo. I walk on the sidewalk, I'm just another ant. I sit, I am a shitting beast. When I fly, even sitting down, or in my mind, I am a spirit again. 
create a poem? I'm all of the above. At least tried to get personal there. Some feelings there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I had planned to share four. How many was that? Was that four? That was three. Oh, man. Okay, I got to do one more. Is there a level four? I don't know, but here's a more recent example. Um, and after I read this, I invite anyone to share what they want to share too. If you, you had something in your back pocket you want to bring out. Uh, okay, yeah, when I was thinking what to do today, the two things I thought of were metaphor dice and of course, your own examples. And uh, one more recent one from 2017 is, one of my personal favorites, although it's not one of Coco's favorites. Coco prefers my little chocolate donuts one. Uh, you know, there's this, there's some metaphor about you know the door looks like a sponge cake and you know stuff like that in that one. That's true, but this one I like a lot because it's it's my real life experience and it's like it's trying to be creative with my real life experience based on that cl classic 13 ways of looking at, right? 13 ways of looking at poppies. Poppies, 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 poppies. Blown around by the breeze like citizens by politics. If Moses had hiked this hill, he would have said the clusters of orange flames were beautiful signs of God. Walk as a t-shirted giant in the land of the poppies, swaying by the passing wind. Open petals take in the sunny flow of air, fed the feeling of being alive. Shadows pass over the poppies, shoes temporarily knock flat the poppies, the, poppy, the, the poppies bounce back up, lifted by the following. A field of orange and yellow and purple brings delightful color to the brown hills, the cloudless blue sky. Kneeling amongst the poppies, get close to pure beauty fitting right in. Spotted desert brush enhanced by orange and yellow and purple clumps, such harmony in the variety of colors. The sign says Poppy Festival, April 22nd to April 23rd, but it's already here. Bearded, an unbearded men stroll, surrounded by poppies, smiles all around. Buds hang together like a group of poppies, grow to love the company. Outside with the wind, well, outside with the wind, no, I'm not sure how that goes. Outside with the wind dancers, yeah, that's probably it. Sashaying to the music of the breezes, 24 hours every day. Put anything next to a poppy and it's livened up. A bouquet of flowers and object. So to me, this one's more personally revealing of my own emotion. And a metaphor seemed to pop up here and there. It's not necessarily a conceit. It's just what comes to mind, I guess. Uh, and does that does that sum up metaphor where we're we're in the midst of something like Coco is saying we're in the midst of something and then uh, the thought pops up the correlation pops up. Well, that poem reminds me of an experience I had at the public garden here in Washington, where the woman said that the poppies needed to be pulled up because they were weeds and invasive. And I said, but they're the California state flower. And she says, they have to go. Oh. And I feel, I feel like that's a metaphor too, but I haven't figured that out yet. Wow. You know, I may pop in and say something here. Um, Please. Uh, last year, and I'm gonna just check here to see the time. Right, so around October last year, uh, it might have been various workshops. Who knows what was going on with me? And everything was online and Zoomed, right? And I think I was in sort of a rebellious, I'm sick of people talking about metaphors and metaphors in poetry. And really, what if I can't do it? And, you know, on and on. 
And I wrote this short little snippet. I'll do a, a screen share um, if I might and, and show it very short and read it. Uh, because like in the process of, of rebelling against metaphor, I was ended up rolling in metaphor into the poem. So ho hold on, it's really short. That raises the question, can you write an anti-metaphor? Is there such a thing? Well, find out. Maybe you guys can give feedback. It really is very, very short. So okay. it's literally this. About the metaphor. This is not it. Me. Upside down. Behind my nose. Mouth whipping black inked strokes. Pen eyes dripping. And I laugh at myself every time I read that because oh, of that's the fact a pretty that good it, metaphor, pen eyes. Oh my goodness. Because of the fact that it was saying, ah, to hell with metaphor. And where does it end up, right? There you go. Yeah, it was a great metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> wow, so, thanks for sharing that. That is yeah. a great example. Well, well, okay. If anybody else wants to share something, we have a few minutes left, or if you want to say anything. <laughs> I think haiku was intended to be anti-metaphor, um, the original intention where you were just supposed to describe nature mm. in a succinct- The resonance of images, right? An image itself, yeah. like the green plant, uh, for lack of a better thing, was behind your head. Uh, but, then, but then in, an, in a haiku, and I'm gonna head over to Chris in a minute. Haiku, uh, you have that green plant, but then something has to happen, right? Uh, yeah. Some, some comparison has to happen. The green plant, my, my inner insecurity, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the intention is supposed to be anti-metaphor, but you often end up in metaphor when you, mm -hmm. when you attempt to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Chris. Um. Let's bring up a question. Uh, is there a verbal metaphor? If I say something like, uh, as I did in my poem, um, we were soaring through the nebula. Um, soaring is not something we can actually do unless we have special equipment, I suppose. Um, and there are a lot of uh, constructions like that that's very common where I or <coughs> the protagonist or somebody in the poem is doing something that is not really characteristic of that person or of that thing. Not uh, in reality, not, not in actuality. It's surrealism, right? Like in a cartoon. You can do things in a cartoon that you can't do in a film. It's just like in a poem, you can do things in a poem that you can't do in real life. Mm -hmm. right. um, and that's kind of a comparison of something that's not really related or of two things that are not really related and it's a very powerful one but would we call that a metaphor it's just uh, an active or verbal comparison of two unrelated things that adds um, significant depth to the expression is that like um, more like personification where you're given the individual uh, qualities that they want to have? So like to soar, bird soar, so you give them like bird-like qualities um, or, or is it something different? It's, it seems to be something different if I wanted to have a um uh just describing characteristic i could say that um i am an eagle soaring in the sky um but if i say i soar like an eagle um that's again saying something that i really can't do or that people really can't do in general um although it has a, a simile at the end I, it implied I am like an eagle. Mm -hmm. but it's really the soaring that's eagle like. Mm -hmm. 
I'm looking for a surrealistic poem. Does anybody want to say anything for a minute while I find this poem? <laughs> I have a, another I poem. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that nobody would really describe soaring like an eagle as um, out of the ordinary or surrealistic. Well, it's, it's very common to say that. <coughs> you could even use it in a song. Uh, I found one. <laughs> this is a moldy oldie. It's, uh, you've heard of Gulliver's Travels. This is Campbell's Travels. I looked around the room and my poetic eyes grew big. Posters were just postage stamps. The door but a chocolate bar. I punched a hole in the paper thin wall, lifted off the roof like it was a book and stood up and surveyed my new toy world. All around me, tiny models I could have destroyed save for my feeling of guilt as stepping on ants and uncles. I stomped out into the ocean, which soon seemed a mere puddle I left the earth behind and started playing marbles with the stars until the heat of the explosions became too much for my mind to take. And I realized again, I was only a poet in this cafe, wanting to create something larger than my life. Hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so I, you inspired me to find it. Surrealism, that's just, a, that's one of the things that attracted me to poetry in the first place. One of the first poets I ever read and enjoyed said in another episode was James Tate, and he was very surrealistic in his poetry. And, that, that, and it was sometimes humorous, right? It's like you're, you're putting people on. But he was talking about serious subjects like the death of his father. His father was the lost pilot and he's been dead for 50 years, but he's still orbiting the sky <laughs> spiritually, watching over his son. That's what his son liked to believe. I got a, a short one, Don, um, that I also wrote in Rudy's uh, workshop. Um, my family is a lake with a rip current. Everything looks peaceful on the surface, but below there are secret dangers that threaten to drown my peace. No longer can I lit, no longer can I be in these waters. I've never been a good swimmer. It was only a matter of time before the deep claimed my soul too. I prefer the safety of the shoreline where truth can stand on its own two feet and lies have nothing to hide beneath. Yeah, and that's a great example of how uh, our emotions are the foundation of our poems, right? They come from the heart, but they shoot through the head. It's like the heart feels something in the head diagnosis and the blend comes out <sighs> fabulous that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm a fan of James Coates poetry right there definitely you know. yes you must do great things young man <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm trying no pressure <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I mean uh, you you know you're a poet or you're not and you are and you can't help it Right, you couldn't turn it off yeah. if you tried. You know, that's the way it is. That's when you know you're a poet, right? Yeah, I wrote. I wrote a one last night. I was trying to do a more relationship-like poem. Po poem. Well, I haven't posted anything since the end of of last uh, month, and so I was like, I need to post something. So yesterday, I was like, I'm going to work on something to write, and so. Um, yeah, you were doing daily videos, right? Your idea. Uh, every day. Yeah, 30 for 30 last month for National Poetry Month. Okay. And, and so then I took a little break. And so I worked on a, a new short poem uh, yesterday. Um, and I was like, I want to write something sweet, or maybe not sweet, but something related to love. So uh, I'll probably share that with uh, everyone on, on IG today. Oh, okay. Stay tuned for that video. Okay, I thought you were going to do it now. <laughs> no, I was. No, it's going to be a. a um, so if you're image. on Facebook, friend James Coates, and then you can see his almost daily. Often. <laughs> Very often. Oh, um, oh yeah. I just, or uh, or Instagram. Facebook and, is uh, a pretty good vehicle. Uh, Instagram. I tried Instagram, but it was a little bit 
commercial for my taste. I don't know. Yeah. On Facebook, I can get the pure James Coates, you know? Yeah. How does Instagram work when you do that? Is it like telling your story? Because Facebook tried to imitate Instagram by having their right, your story thing, right? Uh, um, I don't really do the stories. I do the the regular posts. So I try to keep the poem within uh, 60 seconds. Or if it goes over 60 seconds, um, that's all people are going to get is a portion of the poem. And then they got to come to Facebook to get the whole thing <laughs> um, if they're interested or buy the book. Um, so well, that Instagram has a time limit. Is that what you're mm -hmm. saying? Yeah. So you can do the stories, but I don't like doing the longer stories um, because less people see those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another reason to write poems. I mean, I've never had an inclination to write stories ever, not really. Poems always appealed to me more. Uh, I don't know how anybody else feels about that. But it's different, just, it's just so, it's so immediate, yeah, but I've written good, I mean, I've read good stories, right, by masterful writers who, who keep it interesting all, all along the way. And one that comes to mind right away is Douglas Adams. I don't know if anyone here has ever read Douglas Adams, the late Douglas Adams, God rest his soul. He, he would just continually make the funniest metaphors in his stories, uh, just, uh, just seeming out of the blue, just wacky stuff that just actually had something to say. And then I heard, learned his book was banned from schools. Why? Just because he has a paranoid android that's depressed? Can't have one of those in school? Oh, my goodness. They're protecting kids a little too much, maybe. I don't know. Or I'm starting to rant. Was that Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yeah, Hitchhiker's that Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, it's a, it's a banned book. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Yeah. I'm uh, jumping subject here. Final word from. Good. Someone was about to speak. Uh, yeah, I was going to talk about poetry versus prose. And I'm yeah. just finishing up Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde. And she talks about poetry and economy and how it's sort of an art for the oppressed um, in that it's uh, prose is a more sort of a luxury sort of art where you have more time to write out a novel where poets are um, kind of the people's artist where you write your poems between at lunch hour on the on the subway on napkins and it's it's less formalized and more earthy and real well, that's a wonderfully positive note to end this episode on. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I'm going to conclude the recording.